a very loud voice, so it always takes me an adjustment. So how does this sound? Good? Okay, exciting. I'm gonna stand on this side too, so hopefully not a lot of awkward echo. Um, cool, so I'm so excited y'all can make it out tonight. Uh, we have some really exciting people, and I get to be really, maybe super jazzed because I can ask deeper questions about things that I, I get really excited about. But um, a little bit about me and why I'm excited about this topic. So um, kind of as Nathan was saying, Metis, I actually am a career changer. I came out of the politics space. And for me, data was always super exciting. Uh, understanding that a few years ago that I could actually do more than SQL and write a little bit of code. Um, over the last few years, I started to work more intensely with Python. That's very much what I do day in, day out. If you want to talk Python, let me know. Um, but yeah, I work on a data science team here at a company called Chicago here at a company in Chicago called Sprout Social. So if you do have any questions about that, if you love social media and all that jazz, I'm very excited to talk to you about that. But without further ado, I do want to turn it over to our panel, and I would love if you could just introduce yourself with your name, what you currently do, and then a little bit about the problem space you work in, as we'll be asking questions more specifically oriented, oriented around the research that you do. Uh, sure, yeah. Uh, hello, everybody. Thank you for uh, coming. Yeah, my name is uh, Slim uh, Bartaji. As you can tell, uh, my name is Slim, but I'm not Slim. <laughs> yeah. I am uh, the <laughs> Big Data Practice Director of uh, Advanced uh, Analytics. Uh, you gave me the opportunity, right? And so, yeah. <laughs> yeah, Advanced Analytics is a company, a consulting company, uh, highly specialized in Advanced Analytics, obviously. So part of it is the streaming analytics. And um, yeah, in my case, uh, I'm working on this space for a lot of years. So since, uh, since 2010, I started working on uh, big data, and now the buzzword becomes later fast data, whatever, real time, and I keep following these uh, this, uh, buzzwords. Yeah, so that's about it. In relation to streaming, also, uh, I run a few uh, meetups. I gave a lot of uh, talks uh, in the United States and uh, overseas as far as uh, China, <laughs> so that was uh, uh, as far as I can go, and I stop here and let my colleagues uh, introduce themselves. Thank you. Hi, my name is Tony Belkin, I work for Here Technologies, also known as Here, also known as NavTech, because uh, a lot of people know that. So what we're doing, we're building a real-time reality index for the world, which includes maps and a lot of real-time data. So we you know, built internally a lot of uh, real-time pipelines to keep the map and our data accurate. Yes, if you're not familiar with traffic or other things, that's, that, that's what we do. And uh, we're also now building an open location platform, which I'm responsible for, which allows the developers to come in, bring their data, and create uh, real-time uh, services. Yeah. If you have any questions, we can talk about it later. Hi, my name is Annette Nemeshovsky, and I work for a company called Aptitude. We are a small consulting company here in the Chicago uh, area, and we're about 24 people now, so we're growing. Uh, I'm our Application Development Practice Manager, and also our Microsoft Partner Alliance Manager, so we'll have probably hear a lot of Microsoft down right now. Um, and I have been in consulting for 20-something years. <laughs> I'm going to probably specify that, but um, we do help our clients right now. My focus really is around IoT, so a lot of my data streaming is about IoT solutions and helping our clients with that. We also do a lot of data-centric projects where we have a machine learning um, practice and a data analytics practice, so kind of full-scale consulting. Thanks. Hi, my name is uh, CJ Woolard. I'm a senior principal engineer at Uptake. Uh, so Uptake. Uh, focuses on predictive analytics for heavy industry. Uh, so what we do is we ingest uh, high volume, high velocity telematic data and uh, try and join or marry that to uh, slow moving enterprise data and then run uh, all sorts of data science models, uh, machine learning, analysis detection off of that. Hi, I'm uh, Dean Wamper. I have a made up title. I'm VP of Fast Data Engineering at Lightbend. <laughs> Uh, what that really means is I'm running the uh, team that's developing a platform for fast data, and it's really just a, a curated collection of the open source tools that you've probably heard of designed to make it easy to run these things. It's really the plumbing side of the, of the big data world is what I'm focused on. Very cool. And one thing I did want to highlight is we will have a few minutes 
towards the tail end of our time together to have Q&A with you all. So I would just ask if you do have any questions where it, ne it necessitates an organizer, you met the two lovely ladies helping run the evening tonight, definitely flag them down. Otherwise, we'll turn it over to you all when we have time at the end to ask your questions. Sound good? Yeah. Cool. All right, awesome, I appreciate that. Um, so that all being said, I was gonna actually ask this one a little later, but I really enjoyed that it kind of came up itself which one of the things I know I get really mystified a lot with is every buzzword that comes my way. So, you know, we have this idea of big data, and now, you know, if you, if you spend a little time Googling, I was looking at an article from Forbes in March 2016, and they're like, now business is all about data as a service. And they're saying that the shift is that we're no longer gonna be talking about big data, but we're gonna be talking about things like uh, fast data, as we kind of heard earlier, or actionable data. So I understand that our jargon kind of expresses a little bit of our unknown, and maybe we're always trying to situate ourselves with whatever someone thinks is exciting, but I'm kind of curious, as professionals and researchers and academics in the field, could you talk a little bit about what you think some of the future trends are currently when we talk about uh, streaming, uh, stream processing and as streaming becomes more actionable in other industries, what do you think we can expect to see as a change, be it now or in the next coming months or in the next year or so? Specifically, the emphasis here being we have a lot of jargon. I really want us to understand why there's now a shift from this idea of big data into what we're saying as actionable data and fast data. Whoever wants to take that one away. Yeah, okay. thank you. Yeah, the, the buzzword fast data is to make uh, the distinction uh, between fast data and big data. Already the word the big data, when you talk about big data, it, uh, the, uh, if you are familiar with the 4V, right? Velocity, volume, uh, veracity, whatever you, uh, you, IBM originally coined that, right? So now the trans and another buzzword is fast data, but uh, in my humble opinion, it's not about uh, buzzword. There is really a shift uh, in the industry from uh, batch processing to stream processing. So uh, I gave a talk uh, here in Chicago, um, not that long ago, like um, one month ago, and I used the picture to uh, depict that. So the picture shows two boys. One is drinking from a bottle, and the other one drinking from the hose. So that's the difference between batch and streaming. So uh, the data is flowing nonstop, and the other one, you store it. So the paradigm shift is the following. In the past, you collect the data, you store it, then you process it. Now the, the, now the, the thing is about fast data is our streaming uh, data is uh, that data is flowing, data is in movement, and you sense it, you analyze it, and later uh, you may decide to store it or not, right? So that's the, that's the thing. Uh, why this is happening now, not before? So that's maybe a simple question, right? Yeah, uh, uh, streaming uh, is not uh, a new paradigm. So uh, many companies are familiar with it. There is uh, many tools available in the market for a long time. But why it's happening uh, now? It's happening now, actually, uh, here maybe a, a shameless plug. I gave a talk last uh, year at the Hadoop Summit, and it's still one of the most popular talks. It's actually number four. Uh, so the thing is, uh, we said this is not just about technology. It's about the people. Uh, if, I, if I ask this question, uh, who does not have a mobile phone? Can somebody answer this? See, not a single uh, person. So what's happening now? You are using your my, uh, mobile, maybe now I'm going back uh, to my place, I might uh, call uh, Uber, right? So that's everything now is becoming, uh, uh, happening actually through your uh, mobile, so the world is digitized. And what's happening now, as this data is available, it's being processed instantly. So this is one. And the people actually uh, who are using this technology, they are familiar with uh, using, um, let's say, uh, LinkedIn, Twitter, whatever. Now in your mindset, you expect when you are dealing now with an enterprise, with a business, to have that same, so your expectation is different. So that's one. The other one are the business too. So obviously processing this data very fast is a competitive uh, edge So be because it gives you uh, yeah, faster insights and for many reasons when it comes to infrastructure. In the past, uh, historically, uh, for example, I have a strong uh, or heavy background in financial. So in the past, why people process uh, data? Because they have to wait until the end of business day 
to do some uh, yeah, uh, analyze, analyze their data and then create reports and give them to the upper management. So uh, it's not just about the technology, it's about even the way how the business is run. So that's number two is the business. So we say about the people, number two is the business. Number three is the, the data, not in any order, but this is, a, uh, this is some criteria. The data itself now is happening, uh, is available, most of it and, and streaming. By the way, everything that's happening in this entire world, the real world is happening in streaming. It's not happening in batch. You breathe, that's a streaming. You do a transaction, you buy something, you, uh, you visit a website, you click on something. Everything is the same. So nobody dumps on you one terabyte of data, so that's artificial thing. So the data itself is happening in streaming. Number four is the proliferation of technology. And I will stop here, uh, I will give my colleagues a chance. I know if you don't stop me, I can talk about hours about this. So that's why I'm now uh, uh, I'm watching myself. Yeah, I will stop here. <laughs> so time is money, that's really the exact. summary. Exactly. <laughs> <laughs> um, so Annette, I'm kind of curious because you've mentioned you've been in consulting for a while. Could you speak a little bit to some of the be it a shift in the problem space or maybe some of the things that you have seen in your time, um, be it trends or maybe just up observing the business. Can you speak a little to that? Sure. Um, I just, I think a little bit when you said the people, you know, the, for a long time, companies just wanted to get the data and a lot of it was bad because they're like, oh, some distributor has some data and I can get it. And they just kept collecting it and now it sits in a data warehouse because somebody had a great idea to build a data warehouse. My company probably built it, we're happy. But it just sits there, so nobody knows what to do with it. And I think this is where the action elbow comes in. I think the real excitement for me on all of the streaming analytics and everything that's coming is that we can now take some of that batch data, it might still come in a batch, but we can um, energize your data warehouse with the streaming data that's coming in real time and make real actionable business decisions in real time and not have to wait two weeks for a cube to be built and the analytics to run and kind of crunch all the numbers. It, that stuff still has to happen but it just happens a lot quicker with some of these tools and the predictive analytics and machine learning allow you to actually look forward. So you know we've been looking back for years Looking back for years, back, I mean, when I started, we had COBOL mainframe. So it's always been looking back. And this is the first time when we can actually look forward. And I think that's really exciting. So, I mean, so we're talking a little bit about batching. And I know that one of the panelists actually submitted this question. So I'm curious about this. Namely about the idea of shifting from batch processing into streaming. So when you kind of get to that point where you might have already existing infrastructure and you start thinking about exploring new technologies, uh, what, it, what becomes the tipping, tipping point with a, an existing infrastructure to start exploring streaming? And how do you kind of think about articulating that to non-technical stakeholders? Or how do you articulate that to technical stakeholders? I'm a little curious about that. Is that me? <laughs> Uh, you know, what I've noticed is a lot of people don't necessarily switch from batch to streaming. They just start adding stream processing to their existing batch infrastructure. So, for example, they might still be doing data ingestion for warehousing purposes and the usual stuff that you do with warehouses. But, you know, they, they want to start processing the data faster either because they have latency restrictions like, you know, they're serving maps in real time like uh, here does or something like that, so they have to respond quickly. And it turns out there's other advantages like averaging your, or amortizing your infrastructure over the day rather than having spikes of traffic. But, I, but that's what we're seeing actually. It's not so much really a movement away from the batch or as a more uh, maturing of the ecosystem and people just adding a lot more kinds of processing. That's fair. So, okay, maybe you're at the point where you're starting to integrate some of this into your infrastructure. So what, when choosing your, uh, yeah, your streaming tools, what are some important considerations you all have noticed, or be it maybe you're creating some of these technologies, what are important considerations to think about when you are making that decision of what to integrate because there's a lot to choose from, correct? So anyone have any feelings yeah, on I'll, that? I'll, I can reel off a list quickly because I do this talk all the time, <laughs> unfortunately. But um, so it's latency, like how much, what's your budget for processing? A typical credit card company gets 10 milliseconds to authorize a credit card transaction in like a e-commerce site, for example. Uh, there's the volume, you know, what's your amount of data per second. There's the kind of analytics you're doing. Are you just doing 
you know, basic ETL, like just getting data into a database, or you're running like machine learning models over it. And the last one that I run into a lot is um, uh, what's the integration that you need to do with other tools? Are you just reading and writing Kafka topics? Or are you reading web services, writing to databases? So there's a bunch of criteria that I use when I decide which tool to use. Yeah, I would like to add to this uh, one. Yeah, again, so I won't say a shameless plug, but uh, I will give you a reference here. Yeah, I gave a talk at the Flink Forward uh, almost two years ago, back in uh, October 25th, 2015. And, uh, and my talk was uh, contrasting two uh, popular streaming technology, Flink versus uh, Spark Streaming. So the slides are available, so um, much more than uh, what Dean was mentioning, so uh, I'm sure he has more, but uh, the constraints is time here. So I came with a framework to help you evaluate the different tools. So that's kind of like, so the thing is, uh, what I would like to say, is not just about the technology, the tools themselves. It's about also the people. So it depends on if your people are familiar with a specific technology or not. Because sometimes you might end up having a couple of technology which can fit the bill. So there is other consideration here. So uh, are, do you have the capacity here? Do you have people in house? Do you need to use uh, tools? Uh, because sometimes now the trends we are seeing maybe here, uh, yeah, plug for uh, for uh, for Dean. You are seeing now uh, uh, tools being packaged. So in the past, when it comes to streaming, you need to stitch things together, and this is a very complex, actually. So now you are seeing that one of the trends is you can go, so it's almost now you go buy something, obviously here, uh, you get the service with it, so from the shelves. So this is another consideration. Another consideration is, uh, is uh, the company itself, so because it depends on uh, the tools that you already have uh, in-house, so that's another thing. Because most of the time when you build a streaming application, it doesn't work uh, yeah, in, in silos. It uh, needs to get data from other uh, systems. Let me give you a concrete example. Let's say, for example, you have mainframe data. And you need uh, somehow to have this data available to you so, that, so you can merge it to another data and do some uh, real-time things. Uh, here, your uh, choice is not that much. There is only, uh, I'm aware of, one tool which allows you to get data live from mainframe and push it because when we talk about uh, uh, stream uh, analytics tools or it's not just about the stream processing that's one aspect so there is the aspect of also getting the data in and out there is the aspect of storing the data so it's a uh, full uh, things so what I, if i summarize this uh, it's not just about technology it's also about the people it's about the organization uh, if you are curious go to slideshare.net and uh, search for my name or just search for Flink, you will see that uh, framework available for you to use for free, so I'm not uh, charging you anything. <laughs> so that's the thing here, So because you came here, so that's an extra thing. The other thing that I would like to say, when we talk about streaming, it should not be focusing only on the stream processing. There is also the tools to stream the data in and out. There is the tools uh, to store the data. So we need to consider all this all together. Yeah, I hope this helps you. Yeah. Uh, I could just add to what uh, they both said. Uh, we run a few different technologies at Uptake. We have some things that are in Spark Streaming, some things that are vanilla Kafka consumers. We're uh, spinning more and more things up with Kafka Stream. So for us, there are certain things that are table stakes, like what Dean mentioned in terms of uh, they have to meet certain latency and throughput, um, scalability uh, features. And then there's also more advanced features that we uh, looked for in terms of uh, whether it supports joining, stable processing, uh, what its support for windowing is and out of order events. And then there's also the uh, thing that doesn't get talked about a lot, which is kind of the total cost of ownership. So we looked at Kafka Streams and Flink, and uh, a lot of people focus on the feature set, um, but it, it's almost as important or more important, at least for us. We have 30 plus teams now. Uh, how is it to deploy and operate? Does it deploy in a cluster? Is it just a library? Um, when a node tips over, is it fault tolerance where the other nodes pick up? So there, there are a lot of things that we considered and there. Are, I think 40 other streaming frameworks out there, but I think we narrowed it down to, I think, three being Kafka Stream, Splink, and Spark Streaming are kind of the top tier for us. So you were talking about advanced features just in this last moment and the kind of whittling down for us. So I understand that there's kind of common easy wins. Could you maybe talk to us as much as you can, a little bit more about how you think about defining what those advanced 
advanced features are as it's relative to your problem space? Sure, so for us specifically, like I said, uh, one of the things we do quite a bit is um, joining uh, high velocity, high volume data with enterprise data, which is very different in terms of the, uh, it's very slow moving, so the ability to join or enrich data is very important to us. We do a lot of stateful processing, so uh, being able to join with lookup or reference data is important, and then there's a lot of the more boring ETL type stuff where you're filtering, transforming, running validation against the data. And then, like I said, how easy is that to uh, write and deploy out to where, uh, for us at least, we have thousands of different pipelines uh, with all of these things running. What's the total cost to our DevOps team and infrastructure team to keep it all up and running? Uh, there's a monitoring aspect. Um, so like I said, if you're running 40 or 50 nodes and one of them tips over, how do you know that it tips over? How do you know if something's wrong in the code? If you push a bug fix to code, how do you replay that data and resolve the issue? Uh, there's data lineage, um, data governance around it. Uh, we have, like I said, a lot of teams, so maybe this is more specific to us, but uh, we use Kafka as sort of that seam or contract between teams, so we use uh, schemas quite a bit uh, to sort of enforce the contract between our microservices between teams. Annette, I'm kind of intrigued because you mentioned you're in IoT, and I'm curious if you have different considerations that your team thinks about, just because I feel I hear IoT everywhere I turn when it comes to we collect all the data. Yes, um, the one thing I would say, well, first of all, I want to mention the point he had is you don't just throw best practices out the window. All this stuff with monitoring, anything you would have done 10 years ago to keep your applications running, you still got to do all that. That maintainability and all that stuff, if you don't architect it right or put in the right pieces, we're going to have a problem troubleshooting and keeping things up. So kudos for that. Um, the other piece, I think, a little bit in IoT, at least, it, it's a buzzword as well, right? And it almost is replacing big data in some things, I think. I mean, I, I went to an IoT uh, event a couple weeks ago, and everyone was like, well, I have, a, I have a device on my phone. It's connecting to a database. Therefore, I have an IoT solution. And kind of you do. So what I see with our clients is a lot of them are exposing data or ingesting data. Uh, externally for the first time ever, which kind of cracks me up because it's like, how could you not be in, you know, adjusting data from the internet already? So security is a really big thing for us. Security, um, making sure data is secure coming in or going out, we can avoid breaches. Some of the, you know, technologies and tools have, like Microsoft Azure has their Azure Data Vault and Key Vault and all that. There are those processes and tools to support it. But that's one of the areas that I try to help my customers walk through, as well as everything that these other gentlemen have mentioned, because those are spot on as well. So from an IO, really, it's not that much different. It's just that we look at tele telemetry data that is device specific, but the process is kind of the same as everything else. So. I'd like to hear about yours. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> telemetry Sorry, data. Go. Sorry, what was the question? I'm just curious about your environment and the kind of tools. So yeah, and uh, so here, I just maybe go back maybe a couple of questions ago. How do you <laughs> ask, how does environment change? Mm -hmm. So in the in the past, here build maps, and the way you build maps is you have a giant database, and you have information about every piece of the say road network, with some 750 parameters, 200 million pieces of the road saying here's how you do it, and once every few months you compile this thing and you sell to customers, they put in the cars. Most cars today have our maps, so and you kind of work on that cycle. Of course, some of you have navigation in your cars. Now, you need to update it periodically. It costs a lot of money, and it's really people don't update running on the old ones. The current model we're building is completely different because what we do, instead of having, say, thousands of people continuously updating the map and having user community, what we do, we're using car sensors. And car sensors come, you know, cars are connected today, they're sending a tons of sensors, you're building pipelines to analyze the sensor data, you extract features from them, and you update your map on the fly, you publish it, you have a pipeline to update the map, and all of a sudden you create new, new maps and you, you do a differential tile updates to your cars in real time. So your cycle closes very fast, and you can, you know, you can have a few cars go by, detect a new road sign, send it down to the cars in there, and everybody has it. So that's kind of the change the model. But going back to kind of some of the questions related to IoT, we've been kind of IoT business for a while, and uh, the issue with IoT is uh, it's a there's a lot of data, and it's a lot of, it would, so what, what what we're building is we 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 we're kind of building a platform to address other people's uh, ability to create business logic for both uh, batch and stream processing. So uh, going back to the questions earlier, what do you what do you look for when you select a platform? 
a couple of things which was important to us is what's the community around the tools we're picking? Because if you're picking Spark or you're picking Flink, you want to make sure there's a strong community around it. And the second thing we do mention was security. Because we're building a system where a lot of people are sharing data. We want to be able, first of all, you can share the data. Second, you can monetize the sharing. And, uh, and, 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 you, and you protect privacy. So there was a lot of uh, you know a lot of things like that, and that's why we you know we we've been building that. It's it's tricky because if you get in the when you get in the bleeding edge, a lot of the things are functionally working, but then turned into product is is uh, is a shell. Um, so I'm really intrigued just because I I can say I don't inter I don't intersect often with the edge of thinking about. I should be careful when I say this. There are folks who specialize more in thinking about kind of the security layer when you're selecting a tool. So that's a really interesting thing and I'll put a pin on that and I would love to come back to it. But that all being said, I haven't asked you all yet what are some of your favorites and why. So be it that you are just playing and prototyping a solution or maybe there's some tools that you're kind of seeing out there that are that are in early stage of early stages of being prototyped. I'm curious what do you what are some of your favorite favorite data streaming tools and why? Yeah, thanks. Uh, yeah, I like this question, actually. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, the thing is, actually, uh, we are in consulting business, so it's not like we push a solution to our client. We need to understand their business, and uh, we want to ch change their problem to fit, uh, because sometimes people, let's say, they are Spark shop, they are very uh, good at Spark, they will push it, while uh, maybe in that case, uh, Flink would have been a better option, because it fulfills more the requirement. So as of the tools, uh, I think maybe we can ca categorize them in three very briefly, right? So there is one switch which are actually maybe a faster version of Hadoop. So that's uh, what is uh, Spark streaming is, although now the, it's getting better and better, actually it's catching up. So the other one actually uh, from the beginning was built as a, a uh, let's say low latency, high throughput type of uh, uh, framework or tool, Flink is a very good representative in this area. Uh, and another one, actually a new camera here, new camera relatively because it's more than one year already. I gave a talk about uh, this a couple of weeks ago uh, here in Chicago. Uh, the talk is about Kafka streams. So what's important about this one? If you are already using uh, Kafka for, uh, uh, as a message, uh, for transporting your uh, uh, message or uh, yeah, as, uh, as a queue, uh, for many use cases, Kafka Streams is a very easy solution, I would say that, because it's nothing but a lightweight Java library. So it's business as usual for you. And the other advantage uh, being a Java library, you can compose with other things. I can give you a concrete example briefly. Let's say I'm uh, getting uh, some data and I would like to do some sentiment, uh, sentiment analysis. In the, real, uh, in the other tools, you need to pick another uh, tool basically to do that. Here, uh, as you are in the Java world, so there is a pl plenty of, uh, even R itself have, uh, is ported to Java and you can just uh, compose. So short uh, answer is uh, there is not a single contender here. So they are all tools. There is uh, not a single one is actually uh, uh, the silver bullet. So there are tools and they are uh, uh, optimized for specific uh, use case. So it's a case uh, by case. But uh, I would say watch out Kafka streams. I foresee this tool is becoming more and more popular. And uh, it doesn't solve all the problems <laughs> in the streaming analytics or in this. Uh, but uh, it, uh, for example, today you can see there is a blog came out about a bank in Europe, one of the largest bank. They are sending um, real-time notification to their 48 million members. And this is in production for the last six months. So because sometimes people will say, who is using this tool? Not many people. The problem that people, companies who are using, won't go publicly and say, I'm using this one in production. So that's only a few. But uh, Kafka Streams is built on a tool which is very mature, which is Kafka for the last 10 uh, years. So that's uh, kind of like, uh, I think uh, it will be more and more uh, popular. Obviously, Spark streaming is catching up. Uh, Flink is, uh, I won't say just a tool that I know. I'm credited as somebody who brought it to the Western Hemisphere. And uh, here in Chicago, maybe people who already attended that uh, meetups. Uh, and glad to hear, to hear, to see, or to hear that people in Chicago, some of them adopted this tool. So yeah, that's all I have. Yeah. Thank you. Just to add, we also uh, settled on Flink and Kafka. Well, the problem with Kafka is it has no security. 
So we have to put up some security solution around that. So I'd just like to add to that a little bit. Uh, we have been running Kafka streams in production for, I want to say, around nine months now. We have, I think, I heard this morning, 40 or so in production. Apologies for production, so we've had good success with it. Um, one of the reasons why I personally like Kafka Streams and Flink and uh, Beam, which is, if people aren't familiar with Apache Beam, it's sort of an attempt at an abstraction over some of these uh, runners, uh, is the concept of uh, there's a duality between streams and tables. Uh, so Jay Krebs has done a lot of good blog posts on the Confluent blog about it. And then uh, Tyler Akadu from Google also has a great paper out there uh, that talks about it that I, I would highly recommend. Uh, which basically, uh, for both of those, they turn streams into tables and tables into streams, and it's really just composing and how you're mixing and matching at that point where um, what people typically think of uh, historically as databases or database tables are really can be just materialized views off of streams, and you can turn uh, tables back into streams. So it's a very powerful concept, I think. Uh, I'd like to emphasize what he just said. If, if you really want to know what the future is for streaming, read everything you can about Apache Beam because Google is really defining the state of the art for stream semantics. So Apache Beam, B-E-A-M, yeah. And it, it's basically, they open source part of their uh, data flow engine. And you mentioned Tyler Akadow, who's the lead of the project. His, his videos, his, his, which are online, are really excellent for thinking about what would it mean if I wanted to do accounting quality analytics over a stream where I don't know when the data is all going to arrive. How do I actually do that? So stuff like that is kind of what they've been doing. Uh, all the examples that have been mentioned are great. The other one I'd like to highlight, which is uh, which I really like, to sort of bridge the world of microservices and complex event processing with streaming or tools like Akka for uh, middleware and Akka streams. And, <laughs> My colleagues back here are like, yes, he had to throw that in. <laughs> All right. But anyway, no, it's pretty powerful for that middle ground. Yeah, I would like to add something about Apache Beam. So it's not, uh, yeah. Yeah, uh, Apache Beam is not a stream processor tool. It's uh, just an API, so it's an abstraction. So uh, the idea here and the advantage is that uh, you can write your code in Apache uh, using Apache Beam API, and then you can pick a runner. So you can run this on Flink or Spark on Apex or Google uh, Cloud uh, platform. Uh, I was seeing next, next year, this is one of the trends, but uh, I'm following this very closely. I'm not seeing actually at least publicly people coming out and saying that they are using Apache Beam. Uh, the version uh, which came, the stable version came out only what, a couple months ago on May 17th, 2017. So maybe the future, so let's see. But uh, uh, I will say here, actually, Google was uh, the main, uh, let's say, the god of big data were coming with Hadoop. I think here in this uh, streaming, um, that might not be the case, actually, although they push it hard for this. Uh, uh, because at the end, uh, uh, yeah, at the end, they want actually to sell you the Google data platform because it's much more superior than anything else when it comes to operation and running this tool on the cloud. So that's, that's, the, that's the thing. So that's, uh, but uh, the, the, the abstraction itself uh, is uh, interesting. What, what's interesting, all the things that they came with, they were adopted almost on every single stream. For example, if you pick Kafka Streams, Kafka Streams supports uh, late event processing, uh, supports uh, all this uh, windowing, so I don't see much uh, actually uh, uh, differentiator here besides the capability of uh, switching from one tool to the other. Yeah, that's about it. Yeah. So we've talked a little bit about some of our favorites and ones that are maybe tried, true, and blue. Is there a glaring area, and I think, Tony, you spoke a little bit about security. Just, again, I, I think that there's a lot to be said about that. So be, be if you want to go deeper on security, but really, what are some of the glaring oversights you think with, exi with existing solutions that are off the shelf? I'll throw one out. Um, it is really, really hard to run these things reliably for months on end. It is really hard. Most of them are not that well designed to be graceful in terms of recovery. I mean, they're working on it, and all of them have verbiage around checkpointing data and restarting, but it's, it's, it's kind of a nightmare, actually, to run these things. 
I'll just add on to that. It's the same thing. It sounds like all these tools are plug and play, but I don't think that's the case. And there, um, I've done a lot of work recently with the Azure Stack, and they have their um, Azure Streaming, and it's just it's an immature product. I mean, it's they're immature, and so you have to build things to work around them. So it takes a while to get it working. You can do those POCs really quick, and like sometimes I walk into a client, and they're like, "Oh yeah, we had streaming and this morning in a day. Why is your estimate, you know, five hundred thousand dollars or whatever?" I wish <laughs> fifty thousand dollars, whatever. And I'm like, um, yeah, but that was not like real. So, <laughs> so um, I think it is hard. I, that's just what I'll add on to that. Sure. Maybe just a little bit about security. So when you're trying to build uh, something where people uh, want to bring their data and share it in a variety of business models, and you know, have unique data, private only for you, or you can make it available to everybody, or you can design groups of people who can access certain data, maybe put a marketplace around it saying how you can exchange and share data, some in real time, some in the, the data sets. There are very few tools today that support that kind of uh, Capability. So we had to probably spend most of our effort building kind of security solutions around that to enable that kind of capabilities. So we've already hinted a little bit to ease of use, maybe a thing that will prevent you from using something. And also just, again, to reiterate back on the checklist that was mentioned, community, security, privacy. So I'm a little, I'm a little curious. Um, Slim, I believe you mentioned talking about frameworks that can help you understand what might be a good fit, what tool might be a good fit for the problem space you're in. Yeah. Could you speak a little bit more to that? Yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah. actually this is uh, what I call evaluation framework. So uh, maybe here I need to give credit to my uh, ex-company. So uh, I heavily, I was the one leading this effort, but uh, obviously it was uh, teamwork. So from different teams, from uh, yeah, the operation team, from the architecture team, from the, the we have enterprise data service team. So all from different uh, teams, we came together and say, okay, what we need to uh, have, uh, actually what are the criteria that we can use, we can evaluate uh, this tool versus another tool. And uh, as a result, it, it, uh, it came out as it's not just about the technology, as I mentioned, right? And even within the technology, uh, because uh, if you are a developer, you might not think much more about uh, operation and monitoring, but for the operation guys, this is a criteria. For them, it's very important to uh, have a tool that uh, they can actually uh, administer, uh, they can monitor, so this is, uh, this is important. So to, uh, to summarize this, uh, the evaluation framework is available, so if you go, go to slideshare.net and you search for either Flink or Spark, uh, this comes as the first talk, and uh, you can go and copy it, you can download the slides. So what you don't have is the values, because the values keep, uh, keep uh, changing over time, and maybe you can help you actually here <laughs> as a consulting company if uh, you are about to embark into a project, uh, we can help you. And as we said, it's a holistic approach. So it's not just about the, 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 the technology. So, but indeed, uh, as far as I know, there isn't any other evaluation framework available. Uh, sometimes you can find a blog which is comparing uh, two tools based on some feature, but uh, my understanding, and uh, it's not that enough for you to go, because at the end, it's your own use case, it's your own, actually, usage which will dictate which one to use. It's not about the, the pure feature or uh, it's about, for example, Apache Beam is fancy because it has this abstraction layer and they can use. So maybe your entire life you might pick a tool and you never switch to another one. So it, it could become useless uh, feature for you. So anyway, or you might have a team which uh, uh, are very strong in uh, Java and they say, okay, pick Kafka stream, uh, I don't want to use Scala or whatever. So. Anyway, so that's kind of like what uh, my two cents about the uh, evaluation framework. Thank you. No problem. Um, I would love to now to turn it over since we've kind of covered a little bit of like, how do you pick a thing? What, what are some seasoned tools that we like? And maybe where is the next step? So I'm curious, is there anyone out here who has questions maybe for their own use case? Excellent. So this is mainly for CJ. So, um, with Kafka streams or Kafka or it's not specific about anything, but any streaming data platform wouldn't stick to a schema. So when we actually productionalize, I mean, this is a general topic that we want to do. So many of the Spark streaming or other things, end of the day, when we actually convert a stream data 
back into a table or back from there to this. With the varying schemas, what were some of your challenges that you had to face with? Sure, uh, that's a great question. I'm glad you asked me because uh, that's an argument that I've had at this company and previous companies. It's one of the more common ones we have. So there's a, a fundamental choice you make with Kafka of whether the messages you put into it are based on schemas or freeform JSON or throw whatever you want in, get whatever you want out. Uh, there are pros and cons to both. The reason why um, I personally believe schemas are important are they give you that uh, contract where I always view Kafka as sort of a seam. So for us, it's between teams and between deployable services. Um, I know Gwen Shapiro was at a talk recently and compared them to uh, API contracts. So people are doing like contract uh, driven testing. It's very similar. It kind of gives you that uh, safety net to know that if you change something on the producer side, you're not going to break all of your downstream consumers. Um, and then we personally use the uh, Confluent Schema Registry to manage our schemas. It has a lot of nice support for schema evolution, which is another thing that doesn't get talked about a lot uh, in presentations, but I think is uh, very useful to have in place and will save you a lot of time uh, going from sort of your prototype to your real live uh, thing in production. So uh, if you just update a field and it's a union type, things like this, they're not breaking it gives you that guarantee that you can make that change and not have five teams really upset with you when you deploy uh, next day. So we found it to be important. Uh, it's been very useful for us, but it's an ongoing argument uh, everywhere I've ever been. Yeah, just to add to this again, since we are handling multiple customers, we have allowed them to define, send data blobs through it so we don't know what it is, or they can use the schemas, they can declare the schemas. What uh, we're trying to do, we're trying to define canonical models for different types of data, how you are presented. So you can not only, um, so if you have services like map matching or you have some routing, you, you need location data, it's defined the same way across all the mod schemas so, so your service can extract it and then provide value. Yeah, I think I don't have anything to add, as you already <laughs> have mentioned the schema registry. It's an excellent uh, tool, actually, so that's glad. In the past, you don't have that, and it was challenging for you to... But nowadays, uh, it's an open source, although it's, uh, the effort is led by Confluent. I'm not doing any marketing for them, but this tool is open source, so you can use it for your own uh, use case, which, uh, yeah, I know I won't share this publicly. Yeah, you are working in an excellent, actually, uh, type of use case. Yeah, uh, yeah that's very interesting. Do we have any other questions? Yeah, Adrian. Um, is this shift towards fast data affecting your workforce at all from a talent perspective? Is this um, kind of new skills that you got to look for? Is it hard to ramp up on these technologies? Uh, how is that changing things? Sure. Um, so in the consulting world, I would say a little bit, but not completely. In the predictive analytics and machine learning side, absolutely. We let a lot of new talent that knows R and analytics and all of that fun stuff, which I hand over to them because I don't want to learn it. But, <laughs> but on the other side, a lot of these are Java-based things. You have Java people that are calling RESTful APIs. It's their bread and butter. It's what they've been doing. They just have to kind of learn. You know, There's some new learning in there, but their skill sets are very well you know, useful for all of those. So it's not such a stretch for them. So it kind of depends on where you're at, I think, in that life cycle for where the data's at and where you're coming in. Um, on the security side, because that is a passion of mine as well, I think that's new for people, because as developers, they just don't think about it. And I'm kind of like, OK, but how are we going to secure it? How are we going to secure it? So it kind of depends where they're at. That's my experience, anyway. Yeah, just one more point on this. Uh, if you come from a big data world where you're used to running like nightly batch jobs, you know, they, they come and go within hours, but if you're standing up a stream pipeline, it could run for months, which means now you have to be really good at availability, resilience, scalability, all those abilities that maybe weren't such a big concern before. So that's, that's one of the big uh, changes I've noticed in terms of skill sets for these things. I totally agree with that. I'll just add one more thing, which I think it's somewhat dependent on the framework that you choose. Uh, we use Spark Streaming, uh, as I mentioned. Uh, Spark's great, I love it. Uh, takes a bit of knowledge to configure correctly. It's a bit of a dark art to profile and optimize. So there's definitely a skill set required there. Um, and that, that, again, is one of the reasons why we really like Kafka Streams, where it's a 
a little more intuitive. It's a library versus a, a framework or a cluster, so uh, it's a little lower barrier to entry, I think, from a developer standpoint for us. No, we've been at the streaming for a while, so we're going to issue this. Not to steal anyone's thunder here, but uh, I work at a company where we do social media management and analytics. And definitely, we kind of definitely come from the side where we have a lot of folks who are very Java heavy. So working with the, back to what CJ was saying about a contract, I find that that's very intuitive for our folks. And as we branch more into data science, we're now kind of thinking through data governance, what's the life cycle of our data, some security implications, which well acknowledged, now we have to think more deeply about. And for me, that's where I get really excited, kind of coming from that political science space. <laughs> but, but I think that, yeah, definitely very much what, um, very much what was harped here about having a good contract, understanding the talent and the strength of your team, and then picking a tool that plays the strength of that. Yeah, I would like to add something. Uh, indeed, we can say that there is a shortage of uh, yes, uh, when it, skill sets when it comes to uh, yeah, streaming, uh, yeah, stream processing in general. So, and uh, the, the other challenge is that these tools they keep actually, uh, yeah, they are not 100% mature, but they are maturing. So this uh, the API keeps changing. So there is a lot of uh, challenge. But the good news is the following. Now I am seeing a trend among all of them that now actually uh, you can use, um, uh, not obviously for not all use case, you can use uh, uh, SQL to query these uh, streams, which opening the door for uh, uh, other, uh, for people actually who have this uh, SQL uh, yeah, knowledge to use uh, streaming as if it's not kind of something totally actually obscure for them. The other trend also uh, is the following. Nowadays, you see, uh, remember what I said before, when it comes to uh, streaming, it's uh, all the way from uh, getting the data, capturing the data, uh, streaming it to the, and most of the time is Kafka, obviously it can be something else, and uh, do the stream processing and then push it again to another, uh, another tool. So, uh, so there is many different, actually, area. Uh, what's interesting, uh, one of the major trends, uh, one piece uh, of this puzzle, uh, which is getting the data in and out is becoming easy, m m more easy. For example, you can use Kafka Connect. It's about just the configuration of, there is over 70 connectors, so I'm uh, tracking this field, uh, which are, uh, for example, if your data is in database, it's a matter of configuration to get the data to stream it into uh, Kafka. So that makes it easy compared to in the past uh, uh, using sp either uh, yeah, writing your own code or using a separate tool for every uh, single type of uh, data system. So another trend uh, is that you have now GUIs, more and more GUIs. For example, you can use uh, Apache NiFi, which is a mature pro uh, product, to get your data uh, in and out, although that might not be always the right tool for uh, like low latency, but uh, for many use cases, it's the right tool. Another tool also which is open source is uh, stream sets. Uh, another tool also is the CDAP. So there is already three tools specialized and like uh, any to any type of uh, data movement, uh, either be it batch or streaming. Uh, so to summarize it, so I'm seeing two trends here. One is that you can use SQL to query the streams. Uh, the latest version of Spark streaming came out uh, on July 11th. That's Spark 2.2. For a while it was broken, the Spark version 2 was broken when it comes to uh, what they call uh, structure streaming. Now they are claiming that it's production ready, let's see, but if that's the case, I would say if, uh, that opens the door to uh, and make it much more uh, easier. So these two things, uh, the GUI to uh, get the data in and out, the, uh, the, uh, the uh, availability of uh, SQL uh, yeah, as a way to uh, query your, your uh, data, the other thing also that will make it uh, easy, there are tools now that uh, which are actually, uh, yeah, maybe Dean can uh, market his product here, is one of them, so that will make your life easier, because the stitching all these tools together is already done for you, so that's kind of like, so uh, the trans, uh, it will become uh, easy and easy, and I foresee this becoming mainstream, so similar to the way Hadoop, uh, maybe it will take less time, uh, in my humble opinion, for this to become mainstream compared to the time it took Hadoop to become mainstream. Yeah, I hope this helps.
Uh, if you have any other question uh, offline, I'm available actually. <laughs> so uh, yeah, I don't want actually to hijack this. <laughs> this but, uh, anyway, so yeah, you ask it for it, right? I'm answering. Awesome. I'm gonna walk a little bit towards. You. Oh, you're good. Okay. So you offer about first, you know, fast data, all software-based solutions. What about augmentation with hardware, GPUs, encryption uh, cards, anything else? I know a lot of you know here is all AWS. So what have you guys done to augment it to get better, faster speed? So just to kind of speak back, rather than thinking about uh, emphasis on hardware, let's talk a little bit more about hardware. Is that the, the what, just? It's how is hardware helping them? How is hardware helping you all? Okay, cool. I'll, I'll, I'll address part of the question, maybe you guys can get address the rest of it. So the way we do it, we do it in a distributed way. So for example, if you want to get feature recognition out of the car, you're using your car sensors, you're using camera inside the car, you extract the feature, you extract, for example, road sign as you go by, you only send the extracted feature to the network. So you, you kind of distribute the recognition problem across all the vehicles with a gazillion of uh, processors they have in them. I'll just say from the IoT perspective, it's you know device to dashboard, right? So devices, it's the devil's playground. I'm not, there is a new device coming out every day. There are new you know, APIs on top of those devices. So it absolutely can make a difference in your whole stream. Um, from my perspective, I don't start at the device level, right, because I don't manufacture them. So we're just at their mercy. <laughs> and most of the time, we're at their mercy from an IoT perspective. But I'm... Uh, I'm waiting for that to all settle down. I don't know when that's going to happen. So, anyway. Uh, I could just speak quickly to uptake. So, uh, we generally prefer to scale out versus scaling up. So, we try and run on commodity hardware as much as we can. There are certain places where we have to scale up uh, more on the data store side, actually, than the stream processing side. And we're starting to look at uh, some things that are GPU packed, but we don't have to. There's actually a lot going on here that's pretty interesting. So one is that neural networks typically need GPUs for training, for performance. But in the research community, they're actually figuring out ways to cut that down so that you can put these things on mobile devices. So most of our devices, like if you have an Apple phone, Siri is basically a neural net on your phone now. Um, the other thing that maybe the other big trend without going off on too many tangents here is um, when Hadoop was invented, the network architecture that we were all thinking about was slow networks, relatively slow hard drives, and fast memory. And now it's like completely flipped. Now it's actually faster to go over a fast network than it is to go to a hard drive. So the whole idea of data locality has kind of gone out the window for things like processing the, you know, off the, the, you know, the original task in your Spark jobs or whatever. So there's a whole bunch of stuff in the hardware world that's kind of upending the way we do stuff. It's also made fast data possible. But I think the most interesting right now is this trend towards more GPUs. You know, the GPUs all the things, I guess, basically. Um, there was actually a really fast, fascinating talk ex explicitly how Microsoft is doing this at Pi Data Seattle, which just happened this past July 5th, I believe. So it's like a 90-minute talk t telling you how to scale things up, do all that fun stuff if that's what you want to do. <laughs> Oh, yes. Yeah, uh, I was listening to the talk. Of, you know, security came up several times and uh, talk about streaming producers and consumers. And this question came to my mind, a kind of a, a vision. I was thinking, gee, you can imagine a very dynamic situation in terms of permissioning the type of access to streams. And, hey, Wait a minute, uh, it's almost like you could see like an Ethereum type of layer, you know, I'm not talking about the blockchain, but simply like the dynamic um, uh, computing associated with, with, do I make this connection? And I'm just wondering whether there's any, anything out there like that. All right, I can answer that a little bit. Uh, so we actually uh, discussed that recently at Uptake. Um, it, it's an interesting problem. I, I do want to say that uh, Kafka does have security as a 10, uh, so you can do basic security around a topic, uh, so you can do things like authentication authorization. Uh, where it does get tricky, which I think you were alluding to there, is uh, if you have data coming in and you grant permission to that data to some person, and then you join that to another data stream, you aggregate it, you branch it, and you do a 
ton of other uh, transformations off of that, it gets really interesting to try and uh, also flow that authorization chain through the topology. Um, we don't, we're, we're still kind of talking through, there are a couple models you can use for that. I don't think there's any off the shelf answer to that, that was that I've seen. Yeah, I think, uh, yeah. Yeah, I'm sorry here, Matt, I might feel that I'm marketing for a specific product, but just answering to your question of the shelves, actually MapR Streams is a tool which is uh, an enterprise version of Apache Kafka, but uh, it it's, uh, it's keeps the API, it's compatible with Apache Kafka, but uh, the implementation is different. So they have the, the security here is different, so there is something, the notion, the concept of uh, stream and uh, you your security is at that uh, level before even you go to the to the topic so maybe this is something worth actually uh, exploring i'm not marketing for them but uh, answering your question of the shelves it's uh, something that uh, to actually uh, maybe worth exploring yes so the security model in uh, map r streams which is called now map r es is different from vanilla kafka uh, but it keeps the compatibility with the, with the API. So this means you continue coding the way you uh, always have done, but under the hood, it's, uh, the implementation is different. Yeah. A similar trick that they did with the file system when they came with MapRFS or with MapRDB uh, versus uh, HBase. So, this, so the security is, is handled differently than, uh, than Kafka. It's at the stream level. Stream is another concept. It's not the topics. Yes. I hope this helps you. So I think we have time for one more question. If we have any more, oh, awesome. If you want to meet me halfway. So I'm interested to hear some, uh, some of your perspectives on the streaming as a service within AWS and in Azure. It sounds like a lot of you are running on-prem and uh, you know, for a company like myself, we're very small, we don't have the infrastructure or the team you know, the DevOps to, to keep a, you know, a, a cluster running. So I'm interested to hear what, what your perspectives are on, on the services. I would just say from the Microsoft side, it's, um, it's easier to set up than the AWS side, but AWS is definitely more mature and will probably meet your needs better. Um, I haven't had a ton of experience with either one of those. It's just most of the stuff we do winds up being a lot more custom, and it doesn't necessarily lend itself to a lot of custom, custom answers. So if you've got a very specific use case, I think it can serve you well, and it would be easier to set up. Um, AWS might be a little more expensive, but I think they're more mature in the product, at least from that cloud perspective, from the service. Yeah, I think this trend is here to stay for sure. It's really a great example of sort of pushing things to the extreme, like how much can I offload to AWS or Azure and just get it down to the bare minimum of what I have to do. The only big drawback so far other than maturity that I've noticed is you kind of give up control over your latencies a little bit. So if you have strict SLAs, then you, you might be in trouble. And, and that's why a lot of people wouldn't do that necessarily. But if you don't, then I think it's a fantastic way to go. Um, along those points, I have another thing. If you are troubleshooting something and you're mixing that in another environment, I think your troubleshooting will be really difficult because you don't have access to what you need to do to access. And they're going to tell you, you have logs and monitoring and stuff. It's like, well, great. I have monitoring that it broke. <laughs> that doesn't actually help you as much as you might think. So, I'm going to harp Dean and Annette and just say, I feel you. That's where I'm at these days. <laughs> I would like to add, yeah. would like to, add uh, to this, uh, again, this is a case by case. Uh, I would give you a concrete example, right? Let's assume uh, I have uh, a yeah, streaming application when uh, I need to have the data, uh, I will say eight days, how about that? Store it eight days, because as you know, Kafka is not persistent storage, but you use it for some time. You cannot do this in AWS, because the limit is seven, and it's not, it's not something which is configurable. Uh, another thing, when it comes to encryption, and maybe I need to check here because at least in my previous company, that was the reason why we cannot do things. And obviously latency is one of them. The other thing to watch out is the cost too. So basically you need to have something which is monitoring your usage and using this efficiently because it can be, think, you might think that's kind of like a cheaper proposition. That might not be the case. So that's something to watch out. But nowadays, uh, Kafka itself uh, is available. 
as a service uh, on the cloud, so it's uh, another, uh, another option. But if uh, somebody is using already uh, heavily using AWS and doesn't have these constraints uh, of encryption or, uh, the, uh, or uh, configuration, because basically uh, you don't have the flexibility that you have with, uh, with Kafka, that may be an alternative. So short uh, summary is it's a case by case. So we cannot say it's, uh, but there is a trend that a lot of workloads are moving to the, to the cloud. There is no doubt about that actually. So this is happening. Uh, is it every single application? Maybe not, but uh, we are seeing this uh, trend uh, uh, being, um, yeah, uh, more, more and more company uh, are following this trend basically, yeah. Cool, so I'm gonna actually put a Again, a pin in it here. Um, there's so many really cool topics from like security, IoT, hardware you don't own. Hey, maybe you have to use the cloud. There's a lot of really cool things. And obviously our panelists are very able to talk deeply about this. So this is when I say go talk to them, ask them lots of questions because they volunteered their time to come here tonight. So thank you all. I appreciate you letting me uh, help them ask questions. And thanks for asking questions of your own tonight.